Well, my name is Paul Washer, and um, I am 47 years old. I was born in 1961 to a, um, a father who was an unbeliever, but a mother who was a, a strong believer. Her mother, Croatian, was actually persecuted for the faith. My um, grandfather on my father's side was one of the first missionaries to Brazil and um, served there in the 20s and 30s uh, when it was much of jungle and nothing else. Uh, so I was raised in something of a Christian heritage. Um, when I was nine years old, I made a profession of faith and I even wept, but there was no real change in my life whatsoever. And as I grew older, I began to live in greater and greater ungodliness. Of course, being in the denomination I was in, because I had prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into my heart, I always believed that I was saved. Then when I, I went to college, I found myself, uh, after a few years, just at the end of my ropes. Academically, I was doing fine, but morally, um, I knew that, that I was a wretch. I knew that I was self-centered, full of pride, a liar, would do anything to uh, benefit self. And more and more, it was weighed upon me, just my wretchedness. And one night at about one in the morning, when I was contemplating how wretched I was, someone knocked on the door, and it was a freshman from across the hall. And um, he was trembling. And I asked him why he was trembling. And he said, well, you're probably going to punch me. And I said, well, you're probably right. It's one in the morning. And he said, for two weeks, God's been telling me to tell you something, but I'm afraid of you. But I can't stand it any longer, so I have to tell you. And he said, I have a message from God. And I, I literally thought, what is he, some kind of wacko or something. And um, he said, this is the message. God says that you are wretched and you are miserable and you will continue to be miserable until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And it was at that moment that um, God truly began to work in my life in a tremendous way. I was a very, very immoral person. Um, I always say there was nothing uh, noble about my rebellion. If you look up jerk in the dictionary, it had my picture there. That's all I was, just a self-centered, harmful person. And Christ began to work in my life, and um, eventually I was converted. And um, from there, immediately, I felt a burden to preach, to preach, whether it was on the streets or soul winning on the street corner or speaking to my friends. And um, began to just preach the gospel, what I thought was the gospel. I ended up going to seminary. And after seminary, um, I was greatly influenced by George Mueller and Hudson Taylor. And so I, I wanted to go to the mission field, but not with an organization and without really raising support or telling people about uh, what God was doing. And um, my little Baptist church, where I was a member in Illinois, um, under their authority, it's a small church in the middle of a cornfield, I went to Peru. And God began to do miraculous things there. It was a very dangerous country at the time with the terrorist movement, the Sendero Luminoso, or Shining Path. War was on, bombs exploding, dead people in the streets. But God used all of that to begin to transform my life. But mainly I was challenged by an ex-Catholic priest to, uh, who had become an evangelical, a Baptist pastor, to read the Bible just over and over and over. He asked me to teach a class in his seminary, and the first semester was the students had to read their Bible, um, the entire Bible that semester, and write their comments on every chapter. And so I began studying the Bible about 10 hours a day, and that is where my life began to change. I began to see that the gospel that I was preaching was not truly a biblical gospel. I had taken the, as Paul says to Timothy, the, glor the, the glorious gospel of our blessed God, and I had reduced it down to four little questions or five principles or four spiritual laws, and if someone said yes to every one of my questions and prayed a prayer at the end, I pronounced them saved. And I, I realized there was always a catch in my spirit when I would do that. And I realized that many of the people who were converted on the street with me never showed up to church, never grew in godliness. So I began to study the scriptures more and more. After reaching some conclusions, I came back to the States for a few months of rest. And there someone presented to me Charles Spurgeon, George Whitfield, 
uh, many of, of the men who are most used to spread the gospel. Um, and I saw that the gospel they preached was quite different than our contemporary gospel. And it confirmed the things the Lord began to teach me. At that point, I had an insatiable desire to understand the cross of Calvary. And until today, 20 years later, the topic of most of my study is what has happened, what happened that day on that tree. And as I travel around the world and I teach on the cross of Jesus Christ, not something new, not some new revelation, but just the old classic historical teaching of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ bearing our sin and dying under the wrath of God to satisfy his justice so that God might be just and the justifier of the wicked. I find that even sincere Christians who've been walking with Christ for 20 and 30 years come up to me with tears in their eyes and say, I've never understood how the death of Christ truly paid for my sins, but now I do. I've always trusted in it for years, but I've never understood it. And so I begin to see that this country and this world is not so much gospel hardened as it is gospel ignorant. And it's gospel ignorant because we ourselves have reduced the gospel down to something that will fit in a track in the back of someone's pocket. And so that's more of the testimony of my life. I, um, when I was in Peru, we began supporting indigenous missionaries. And um, that has grown tremendously now to where we are supporting missionaries through an organization called Heart Cry, uh, missionaries around the world in about 15 different countries on four continents. God has greatly blessed that ministry. And that's where I spend most of my time now. If I'm not preaching in the States, I'm overseas instructing and teaching missionaries. Well, talking about revival, there's great misunderstanding, especially in the South, in the United States of America. People uh, will call me and say, we want to have a revival. Can you come and preach? Well, for the most part, revival is not something that you can create or make happen in a week of preaching. Another thing very important about revival is many people mistake revival for evangelism, that uh, we want to preach to the lost and see them saved, and that is a revival. Well, in order to have a revival, something must be made alive that has fallen asleep. So revival occurs primarily among the people of God. And so when we talk about revival, it is an extraordinary work of God to bring the people of God back to where they ought to be, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, living in obedience, and that obedience manifesting itself in love for God and love for God's people. Now, whenever there is a revival, there will also be the added benefit of an ingathering of souls. But we need to think of revival as, first of all, among the people of God. And it has marks of things such as a passion for Christ. It has marks such as a greater desire for holiness. There will be a brokenness and a deeper repentance, but it's not a repentance unto death or desperation. It is a repentance unto life. The people who are most broken in a revival are, in the end, the, most, the people more, most joyful in the Holy Spirit. Now, there is something of a revival going on today. Now, the pop culture and media and even most of the Christian media, they, they're not in on it. But what it is, it's an awakening. Many of the young people, I would say 30 years on down, are beginning, they, they are tired of what they are seeing in contemporary Christianity. And they're not seeking new revelation. They're going back to the rock from which they were cut. They're going back to the Spurgeons, to the Whitfields, to the Wesleys. And they're beginning to see the way Christianity ought to be. And I can see it throughout this country and throughout this world that we are seeing a return to the truths that bring about true and enduring revival. I'll talk for just a minute on... Um, on revival and prayer. There are two extremes out there. There are people who say, you know, revival will come when God wants it to come. It's all in God's providence, so all your praying matters nothing. There are other people who think that actually through their praying, they can manipulate the hand of God and bring revival. I don't agree with either camp. Uh, it is a mystery, the work of revival, but this is what I believe. I do believe that revival is a work of God's providence. And I believe that the first fruits of revival 
And the means through which God brings revival is the praying community. Whenever I see a group of people gathering together to pray for revival, I'm not thinking simply that I hope revival will come, but I'm thinking to myself, here I see the first fruits of revival. And I do believe God's doing a work, and I do believe that revival of some sort will come. And I do say of some sort, because we don't need to put God in the box and think this is exactly how the revival is going to work out. Another important thing about revival is this. You cannot neglect the word of God and neglect doing the hard work of the word of God in reformation and then pray for revival and expect for God to send the Holy Spirit to clean up our mess. The men who are praying for revival have to also be courageous enough to work for reform. If I tell any group of people, any group of evangelicals on the face of the earth that I'm praying for revival, they'll pat me on the back and say, that's very nice. But if I announce that for revival to come, there are many corrections that must occur in the church and that the church is wayward and the church is not following sound doctrine and many things have to be changed, there is where the battle lies. And so it's not just revival, it's reformation. It's reformation. We have to clean up our gospel. We have to obey the commands of God with regard to our personal life and the church. And we have to realize that we are not allowed with the church of God to do what is right in our own eyes. But God has left us precepts and commands to follow. And I think that to the degree that we seek for revival, we must also seek to be submissive to the commands that God has already given us. When we talk about revival, as I've said, we've got to talk about reform. And there are some areas that are blatant that I believe needs to change. Uh, the first one is, is with regard to the sufficiency of Scripture. We cannot do ministry according to the anthropologist and sociologist and cultural expert. We have to do our ministry in the church according to the Scriptures. It's the work of the exegete and theologian to tell us how the church is to be run, not a questionnaire given to ungodly people to determine what kind of church they want. Another thing, there is a lack of teaching on the doctrine of God. Most people in America have an idea of God that looks something like Santa Claus and not the Yahweh of the Bible. Also, there is a need to return to a biblical gospel. We have taken the gospel of Jesus Christ and reduced it down to four little laws or principles. And if someone says yes to every question we ask them and pray a little prayer at the end, they believe they're saved. The gospel is about Jesus Christ bearing sin and dying under the wrath of God. He rose again from the dead on the third day, makes it possible for a just God to justify wicked men and continue just. And so we need to call men to repentance and faith, to repentance and faith, to give their lives over to Christ and to be a follower and discipler, a disciple of him. Another thing that is very, very important in the church is with regard to, to conversion. So many people believe that they're honestly Christian because they prayed a prayer, but very few preachers are telling them to examine themselves, test themselves to see if they are in the faith. Because of that, we have a church filled with carnal lost people who sincerely believe they're saved because one time they prayed, again, a little prayer. Another thing that is very important is the reestablishment of compassionate, loving church discipline. God has given this as a grace to the church, not only to keep the church pure, but to lead to the salvation of souls and the protection of his people. We can't neglect that doctrine. Another thing that is extremely important is the family. We have allowed psychologists and sociologists to tell us how to build families. We have to get back to the scriptures and simply do what God has commanded us. Now, one other thing that is very important, and that has to do with the men of God, the pastors. They are not to be uh, life coaches, movers and shakers, great organizers. They are primarily to be men who dwell, who live in the presence of God and the presence of his word on their knees. We need men who will return to their studies, who will seek God, seek his word, live in prayer. And when they come out to preach, something comes out of their mouth more than just some little bit of advice on how to have your best life now. What comes out of their mouth is, thus saith the Lord. People are running to and fro in this nation, seeking a word from God. 
We need men who realize their primary responsibility is to be that of a prophet, to bring forth God's word to God's people and to encourage people with that word and to rebuke people with that word and to be in season, out of season, always doing the labor of a minister and a prophet. These are some of the great things that need to happen. And I believe they are things that I do not believe necessarily will bring revival, but they will be tied in with genuine revival and reform. Let me give a final encouraging word, and it is this. You can always tell the difference between the voice of the devil and the voice of God. When the devil speaks to you and points out your sin, he will always leave you in despair, discouragement, and he will encourage you to run as far away from God as you can possibly get. He will tell you there is no hope. When God rebukes a person or when God rebukes his church, as we see in the nation of Israel, even if he says very, very hard things, he always ends his rebuke with an invitation of hope, an invitation of salvation that no matter what you've become, no matter what you've done, there is hope and there is salvation. Turn to the Lord and you will be saved.